uh, oftentimes different people will be at the pulpit at different times or have the mic in their hands and will say different things, thoughts that I believe are the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it's not for me, sometimes it is, but there just seems to be that time when something is said, a song is sung that my spirit jumps out and grabs a hold of it and says, this is for me, and this is what I need, and I'm going to believe this. Uh, it's it's kind of like my faith fighting for me. My faith reaches out and says, this is my answer to the problem or the issue that I'm facing today. And I felt that when we began to sing that song, even yesterday in that youth rally, it's just... I connect with that. I am free. I'm free to live for God today because I live in the USA. I have the liberty to do exactly what I want. I, I, you know, I didn't have to sneak in here. Countries in the world, you don't tell anybody where you go to church, and they come in every couple of hours, and they, they leave privately. We don't do that in the USA. We're free to live for God. We're free to voice it. We're free to put a T-shirt on that says New Life Pentecostal Church and go out and pass out water on the street corner and free ice cream in the park. That's one of the freedoms I have. But on living for God, there are freedoms that I experience that I can come in here today with a liberty to lift my hands and worship the Lord. There, you know, we take that for granted because in my case, I've been in this thing for 25 years and, and I, I take it for granted oftentimes. You know, I get so used to it. We become familiar with the presence of God. Familiar to the place that it no longer affects us. And, and we take for granted the fact that we can come in and just lift our hands and until someone comes in or maybe we, we find ourselves drifting away from God and then we come back into the presence of God and we think everything's going to be just as it was. We we'll walk back in and then it's like something's holding our arms down. And it's like we can't, Sing out loud. It's like you find yourself just whispering the songs along in the service. And then you come to the true realization of what true freedom is in the Holy Ghost and what it means to have a liberty in the Holy Ghost. We could take turns today holding this mic and some services that we have, and some of you would understand what true liberty is. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Others don't. Amen. Acts chapter 8. And I want to begin reading <clears throat> in verse 25, and I'll lay a little groundwork for you. I won't going to take a long time today. I just want to give you what I feel the Holy Ghost has put on my heart, and then uh, we'll let God do the work that he wants to do. Acts chapter 8, and verse 25, And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. Read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said, everybody say that together. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. I want to draw your attention back to verse 26. The latter part of that says that the Spirit of the Lord spake unto Philip to arise and go towards the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. I want to leave this thought with you just for a couple of minutes today. Despise not the desert. Despise not the desert. To help us better understand this, you'd have to go back to the, the beginning part of Acts chapter 8. Now, the timeline of all that's going on here, Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, they're just wrapping up the stoning of Stephen, and they, they're throwing their rocks and and he's still squirming a little bit. And uh, he's just got done saying, God, hold this not to their charge. Forgive them. And uh, he's breathing a few of his last breaths. And there's this guy there by the name of Saul. And uh, he's, he, you know, he's happy. He's excited. All these things are going on. The scripture continues to say uh, that there was great persecution going out against the church. People were coming under fire. The apostolic church was being bombarded from every standpoint imaginable to man and all this is going on but the scripture said and brother Ellis said it every single night while he was here that they went forth in spite of all that continuing 
to preach the gospel, continuing to allow God to use them, continuing to follow after the Spirit in what God would have them to do. But it stops there in verse 5 and begins to talk about this man, Philip. Now we pick Philip up in verse 25, but it's important that we understand what Philip's going through here. And, and as I begin to, to read this and begin to get into this, I begin to see things this morning that I had never seen before. Philip, the Bible says, goes down to the Samaritans and he begins to preach the gospel. He's preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, they've just come out of their Acts chapter 2 experience and, and the word of the Acts chapter 3 experience of Peter and John at the gate beautiful, raising up the lame man who had asked for alms. The news of all these great things were spreading throughout the land and the apostolic church at that time was riding on spiritual highs and, and there were men who were walking by sick people and just their shadow passing across them they were receiving their healing and, and through this 8th chapter as you read on from verse 5 all the way to the end Philip is going about and laying hands upon the sick and, and Philip the scripture said was amazed at the miracles signs and wonders which God was working among his people. But the interesting thing is to me as I begin to read this. Here's Philip going about preaching Jesus Christ. He's preaching the name. He, he's preaching the power of the name. And the Bible said that, that he's laying hands on people. They're being healed. And he's baptizing them in the name of Jesus as they receive the revelation of Jesus' name, baptism for the remission of sins. All of this is going on here. And about midway through the 8th chapter, the scripture said that uh, when they heard the apostles at Jerusalem, in verse 14, heard that the Samaritans had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Now, it, it appears to me, and I could be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong, that Philip was a very able minister of the gospel. He's preaching with authority and power. People are receiving the word that's going forth, being baptized in Jesus' name. He's doing it himself. He's taking them down to the river and dunking them in, and they're coming up new creatures in Christ, and, and just an excitement in his spirit. But all of a sudden, the Scripture drops in that they tell the apostles back at Jerusalem that there's people being baptized and they've received Jesus' name baptism and the revelation of it out in Samaria. And I'm sure there were some that said, well, we have a very capable minister of the gospel there and Brother Philip and Brother Philip's doing the word of God. But that's not what happened that the scripture said. And I'm just putting myself into Philip's place here for just a couple of moments. Bear with me here. We're going to lay a little groundwork so that we understand what we're talking about. But I just, for a moment this morning, I put myself into Philip's place. Here I am, a young man. I just got the Holy Ghost six chapters ago, and, and God's doing great things in my life. I'm a, I'm a book of Acts apostolic preacher, and, and everything's going great in life. I'm baptizing people and, and seeing miracles, signs, and wonders, and all of a sudden, here comes these two characters, Peter and John, who were sent by the apostles to help me. Here's these thoughts going through his mind. What are you doing here? I'm capable of doing this. The call of God's on. Did you see that lame man over there that I laid hands on and he got up and walked? Didn't you see the deaf ears that God unstopped? Do you not know that I am capable of taking care of this? But the scripture said that they sent unto them Peter and John who when they were come down laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Now what a great miracle it was. But where's Philip at in all this? This capable minister of the gospel. So now we have Philip. Imagine with me. Philip's up here. He's, he's riding high. Everything's going great. He's laying hands on people. People are being baptized in Jesus' name. And now here come two guys through his revival laying hands on people and they're getting the Holy Ghost. And I believe at that point in time that Philip began to enter into a season where God was working in his life. From this point forward, Philip was going to have to learn to walk in the Spirit. Philip was going to have to learn to trust in God and what God was working and moving in his life. And now here they get uh, to verse 25 and they feel like the, uh, uh, that the revival's over and people have gotten the Holy Ghost and they leave Philip there. And, and the scripture said in verse 25 that the rest of the apostles and disciples went back to Jerusalem to continue the work of God that was going on there. And, and Philip's left here by himself now. And he, he's just went through what I believe was probably a, a, a very, uh, it, was, it had to have been devastating to him. 
I just put myself in his place for a moment. And anybody, human nature, just, just put yourself in human nature for a moment. And to be in his place. Here he is. Everyone's gone. The hoopla's over. And he said, now what part did I play in that? These guys came in and laid hands on people. And, and, and God did great things in their lives. But here I was back here on the backside of, of no man's land. And I didn't get to be a part of that. And so here he is in verse 25. And he's kind of searching around. Okay, God, what's next? And the, the spirit came to him in verse 26 and said, Philip, here's what I want you to do. I want you to rise and go toward the south under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now, it's interesting to me that the scripture took just a moment, just a brief three words to describe Gaza to us, this way that goes to Gaza. It's a desert place. It's a wilderness place. It's a place uninhabited. It's a place that if you look up the meaning of it and, and the description according to bi biblical terms, it was a wasteland. It was a place where no one lived. It was a place where zero life was. Anybody ever felt like you're walking through one of those places in your walk with God? The Spirit was leading Philip out of this great revival of, of laying hands upon sick people and seeing them recover and baptizing people in Jesus' name and, and people receiving the revelation of Jesus' name. All this going on to the Spirit saying, I'm going to lead you into the desert place. It's a place that's a wasteland. It's a place that's uninhabited, Philip. But if you but put your faith and trust in me and follow after me, there's something going to happen in the desert place. I can't show it to you right now. You see, we despise the desert places of life. The places that we come into where and we, we walk into services and we can't seemingly feel the presence of God. And it's, it's like we've gone from being spiritually able to see to spiritually blind. And, and everything at home is falling apart. And everything in our personal life is falling apart. We hate those desert places uh, because we can't seemingly figure out what's going on around us. And I, I can't help but believe that that was the place that Philip was in at this time in his life. Uh, walking through the desert, uh, not able to figure out what it was that God was doing uh, or was about to do in his life uh, but I've come today in the power of the Holy Ghost uh, to encourage somebody uh, despise not the desert places of our lives uh, for it is in the desert place uh, that I believe God has got a revival awaiting uh, each and every one of us uh, in your personal life uh, in our lives and as a whole as the body of Christ here he is strolling through the desert. The scripture goes on. He, he, he comes in contact with this man of Ethiopia and eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. He's out here in a place that's uninhabited. He's out here in a place where no one's supposed to be. And he's strolling through this desert place. He's strolling through this wasteland, wondering where in the world am I going from here? When suddenly he encounters, the scripture said, another man. Another human being. I said it last week. God will always bring someone in our path. In the middle of the desert. In the middle of your wilderness experience. God will give us. We don't always like it. Anybody ever been going through the wilderness. And somebody came up. Not unknowing what was going on in your life. And said brother I'm praying for you. I believe in you. Have you ever had that happen? God is given you somebody in your wilderness time. Now because of our pride and our human nature, we don't like to say, brother, pray for me because I really need it or I'm really going through it right now. Oh, thank you, brother. Thank you. Appreciate that. Everything's going great. God gave us somebody to team up with. And Philip in his desert place, the Holy Ghost brought somebody. There was a purpose in all of it. From the day he left Samaria and began on his way to Gaza, which was going to be a desert place, all of this was ordained by God. Philip, I've got somebody waiting for you out there that you're going to minister to. That's the second thing we don't like. In our desert and wilderness experience in our lives, we, we become hermits spiritually. Sometimes naturally too. We don't want to come in contact. With, we don't want to talk to anybody. Don't put anybody in my path today, God, because I don't feel like telling anybody about the change or telling anybody about the gospel today. But in the middle of his desert experience, 
God put someone in his path who was hungry. Can I propose you today that in the middle of his desert experience, there was about to be a harvest of souls. In the middle of his desert experience, there was about to be a revival. I know he had just left a great revival and and this was the most unlikely place to see a revival and a most unlikely place to reap a harvest because nothing grows in the wilderness and nothing grows in the desert place and and you and I know from the New Testament that you and I are likened to trees and vines and that we bring forth fruit And, and in a natural sense it makes no sense that we would bring forth any fruit in a desert place, in a dry place uh, where, where we can draw no nutrients uh, from the ground or from water. But the Holy Ghost says uh, in the desert place uh, there's going to be a revival. Uh, in the desert place uh, when it seems like you're a million miles away from God uh, and you can't figure out what it is uh, that God's doing around you. Uh, if you'll but put your faith and trust in Him, uh, He's going to turn that desert place uh, into a place of revival. Uh, a place of bringing forth fruit. David said, go go to Psalm chapter 102. I shouldn't say David. The psalmist said in Psalm chapter 102. The writer of the psalm here is in a grievous time in his life. He's making a grievous complaint. And I I want to help you. I want to help you understand where where the psalmist was at when he was writing this. in, 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 In the time and the place. In Psalm chapter 102 and verse 1. He said, hear my prayer. O Lord, let my cry come unto thee. Hide not thy face from me in the day when I am in trouble. Incline thine ear unto me in the day when I call. Answer me speedily. For my days are consumed like smoke, and my bones are burned as an hearth. My heart is smitten and withered like grass so that I forget to eat my bread. He was in such a desolate place that he said, I, I'm so caught up in my own problems. I'm so caught up in my own issues that I forget to eat. And I'm withering away like grass because I've become so inner consumed with everything that's going on around me. And then he begins to describe his state of mind. And I want to show you the, the digression that goes on here as he begins to talk to himself a little bit and how he begins to picture himself here. He said in verse 5, By reason of the voice of my groaning, my bones cleave to my skin. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. Now, a pelican is one of the largest birds, one of the largest, not the largest, but one of the largest birds in the fowl family. Uh, It's got a giant wingspan. It's a very large bird. And so he began to picture himself when he started out in the middle of his situation. He said, I can see myself right now, and I'm like a pelican in the wilderness. I'm big, but this wilderness is large, and it seems like I'm consumed by everything that goes on around me. But it was just a little while longer that he began to think again. And he said, I am like an owl of the desert. So he went from comparing himself to this great big fowl to now he's down to something that's a little bit smaller. I I, I used to see barn owls all the time and they were about that tall. He said, now I, I used to see myself as this great big untouchable thing, although I was surrounded by a vast place. But he said, now... I see myself as this small little owl surrounded by a wilderness area and I feel like I'm all alone and I feel like there's nobody out there around me and I have no support and no one loves me and that's the lie that the enemy begins to feed your mind as he begins to extract you and get you to withdraw yourself from the body of Christ. These are the thoughts that he begins to put through our minds as the people of God. But it didn't stop there. And in verse 7 he said, I watch... And am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Now, if you study out in Scripture, you'll find that the sparrow, and in the world that you and I live in today, is the smallest, most insignificant bird in the animal kingdom. That's why Jesus could say, I know when any little sparrow falls... And if I understand when a little sparrow falls from the sky, then I definitely know what's going on in your life. 
That's why he could make that comparison in the New Testament. If my eyes are on the most insignificant, smallest animal in the animal kingdom, and of all the millions and billions that are in this world, if I know when one single one of them falls to the ground and dies, then you can be assured that I know exactly what you're going through today. And I know the exact desert that you're walking through. And I understand the exact wilderness that you're traversing right now. That's how the psalmist saw himself. You see, the book of Romans said we've got to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. It's time to stop despising the desert places. Because if we can open our eyes and our understanding, we will begin to see what God wants to do through us. We'll begin to see the prosperity and the harvest that God wants to bring to our lives in spite of where I'm at. We get so concerned about our surroundings sometimes. We get so concerned about how well things are going in our lives or, or if we've got enough money or if, or if the, the, the family's falling apart or marriage is going. We get so concerned about all these things sometimes that we forget. That God's God in spite of all those things. The prophet Isaiah began to speak prophetically regarding the desert place. And I'm coming to a close if the musicians would come. Begin to speak prophetically concerning these things. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. And the desert shall rejoice in the blossom as the rose. Then shall the lame man leap as an heart, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. He didn't stop there. The prophet had a lot to say regarding this and what he felt the Holy Ghost was talking to him regarding the desert place. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field shall honor me, the dragons and the owls, because I give waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. He said in Isaiah 51 and 3, For the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. Thanksgiving and the voice of melody. I can't help but think in my mind that as the prophet spoke those words that just a few short years later there would be the man who would robe himself in flesh whose name would be called Jesus who would step up and say to people that surrounded him for out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water and this spake he of the spirit uh, that they which believe should receive Uh, that same prophet said uh, for with stammering lips and another tongue uh, would he speak to this people Uh, and this is the rest uh, wherewith he would cause the weary to rest Uh, this is the refreshing Uh, oh I want to preach to somebody today Uh, despise not the desert place Uh, for if you'll but hold on to God uh, it's in the middle of your desert uh, that the prophet said uh, there's going to be a river of living water flowing through it Uh, there's going to be a place that you can draw straight from stand with me right now so Philip kept walking he runs into this man in the chariot then the spirit said unto Philip go near and join thyself to this chariot so Philip went and he joined himself to this man and they began to, to have conversation there was ministry that went forth I believe that there was ministry that ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch that day, but I believe there was even more ministry that was coming to Philip. And he said, what is it that you're reading here? And he said, I'm reading from Isaiah the prophet, and I don't understand it. How can I understand it unless someone tell me? The world's waiting, folks. 
They've watched TBN. They've watched all these things that are out there. And, and, and the, the secular world punches so much stuff into their brains regarding the quote-unquote church world. And they don't understand it, but they're waiting for the church to come explain the way more clearly and help them to understand what it is they're seeing in Scripture. So the Holy Ghost, through Philip, began to explain what this was the Scripture was saying to this Ethiopian eunuch. And as they traveled along in the desert, in a desolate place, what do you know? They came across some water. It wasn't supposed to be there. This is a desert place. This is a wasteland. This is a place uninhabited. How did any water get out here? That's what happens when we keep putting one foot in front of the other in the desert place of our lives refuse to despise it but embrace it and say God I'm going to walk in this thing from daylight till dark through the ins and the outs the uninhabited places the wastelands all of that I'm going to walk in it until I see the fulfillment of it until I know of a surety what it is that you're doing in my life oh let's lift our hands right now and just love the Lord Come on, there's rivers of living water in your desert. There's rivers of living water in your desert today. Come on, God's got a revival for somebody. Come on, there's a harvest for you of souls in the midst of your desert place. Even though you feel a million miles away from God. Come on, it's just a season. And it's going to pass. And you're going to come walking into a place of rivers of living water. Where the Holy Ghost can begin to flow through you. And the power of God can begin to refresh you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, why don't you just take the hand of that person standing next to you right now and let's just bind together and pray. I don't know what you're going through and you don't know what I'm going through, but I can feel the Holy Ghost moving. I see Him moving upon some of you. Come on, your spirit's latching on to what's going on right now. Oh, just pray that God would flow through your brother. If you don't know what else to pray, just pray in the Holy Ghost. That's where the rest of the refreshing comes. Just pray that God would shower them today with His blessings, with His mercy. Mercy and goodness. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus.